The pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to achieve powered flight. They came in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, ranging from the iconic fish-eating pteranodon to the small, bat-like anuragnophids, and even large, dinosaur-eating predators like the asdarchids. Although most media depictions of pterosaurs are restricted to a handful of the same species, they were far more diverse than most people realize. One of the most unusual pterosaurs was Pterodaustro. Its mouth was filled with numerous, long, comb-like teeth, which it used to filter feed in a manner similar to today's flamingos. Hundreds of fossils of this flamingo pterosaur have been found, ranging from adults to embryos. So, despite how strange it was, Pterodaustro is one of the best understood pterosaurs. Pterodaustro was first named in 1970 and was the second pterosaur found in South America. Its name, which means southern wing, references this fact. Most of its fossils come from the Argentine Lagarcito Formation at a site called Loma del Pterodaustro, or Hill of the Pterodaustro, due to the sheer number of Pterodaustro specimens found there. Although most are fragmentary, some are essentially complete. Given their abundance at Pterodaustro Hill, there is little doubt that this bristle-toothed flying reptile didn't live in large groups. Loma del Pterodaustro was formed 108 million years ago during the Albion Age of the early Cretaceous. Back then, it was a shallow lake, and although the paleo environment was seasonal and semi-arid, water seems to have been present year-round. Besides the Lagarcito formation, the comb-toothed pterosaur has also been found in the older, underlying La Cruz formation. While both formations contain plenty of fish fossils, they lack the remains of dinosaurs or other pterosaurs. It was once thought that there was a second pterosaur, a Sungaripterid, in the La Cruz formation, but the fossils turned out to be misidentified pterodaustro bones. Ironically, fossils in the Chilean Santa Ana formation, which were once assigned to Pterodaustro, turned out to belong to a new Sungaripterid pterosaur named Domecodactylus. In stark contrast to Loma del Pterodaustro, the contemporaneous Romualdo formation in Brazil was home to at least 22 species of pterosaurs. Pterodaustro was a member of the derived pterosaur clade Pterodactyloidea. Pterodactyloids had thin wall bones, short tails, and were generally larger than more basal pterosaurs. That said, even though its tail was much shorter than those of its Jurassic ancestors, Pterodaustro's tail was longer than those of other pterodactyloids. The flamingo pterosaur belonged to the pterodactyloid subclade Tenochasmatoidea. The iconic pterosaur genus Pterodactylus, the first pterosaur ever named, is either a basal tenochasmatoid or a close relative similar to the last common ancestor of the clade. Like it, the other tenochasmatoids primarily hunted aquatic prey. Those closely related to pterodaustro, the tenochasmatids, were also specialized filter feeders with numerous, long, slender teeth. The feeding apparatuses of some species, such as Balaenonathus, were strange even by pterosaur standards, but none were so bizarre as pterodaustro. Pterodaustro was larger than most other tenochasmatoids, but still relatively small for a pterodactyloid. The flamingo pterosaurs typically had a wingspan of 2.5 meters, with the largest individuals reaching a wingspan of 3 meters. They are estimated to have weighed even less than that would imply, a mere 9 kilograms or 20 pounds. This was due to its light and thin hollow bones. Pterodaustro's snout was proportionately the longest of any pterosaur. Despite the comparisons made between them, its jaws curved upwards, whereas flamingo beaks instead curved downwards. Likewise, flamingos filter their food through ridges on their upper jaw, while the flamingo pterosaur filtered its food in its eye-catching lower jaw. Tenochasmatids had more teeth than other pterosaurs, but with roughly a thousand, pterodaustra was the record holder by a wide margin. Although they looked almost like the baleen of whales, they're still made of dentin and enamel like the teeth of other vertebrates, yet were also surprisingly flexible. The teeth of archosaurs, the group of reptiles formed by pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and crocodilians, are usually placed in individual sockets, but pterodaustro's bristle-like teeth were so numerous that most were instead set in massive grooves. Although the unusual teeth of many prehistoric creatures were covered with lips in life, this does not seem to have been the case for Pterodaustro. 
Given the excellent preservation of many specimens, lips or a different soft tissue structure covering its comb teeth would have almost certainly been preserved, yet they are absent. Pterodaustro would have needed to take extra care of them, since unlike most archosaurs, it did not have replacement teeth. From this, it can be inferred that, like flamingos, Pterodaustro fed from shallow water, rather than by dunking its mouth into the water as it flew. Indeed, even the skulls of other, more robustly built pterosaurs were poorly suited for such behavior. The jaw muscles of Pterodaustro were more powerful than those of its relatives, enabling it to continuously push water through its mouth. As it passed through, tiny invertebrates would have been caught between the teeth. The space between tenochasmatid teeth is thought to indicate how small their prey was, and the space between Pterodaustro's numerous thin teeth were by far the smallest. The hard-shelled invertebrates they trapped would have been carried away by the tongue to be crushed by the shorter, sturdier teeth in the upper jaw. They were also not set in sockets, but were instead held in place by soft tissue. Pterodaustro's teeth were not its only method of breaking apart the shells and exoskeletons of its food. Two pterodaustro skeletons have been found with stones where their stomachs once were. Modern archosaurs, crocodilians, and birds, as well as some extinct dinosaurs such as sauropods, swallowed stones called gastroliths to aid digestion. As of right now, pterodaustro is the only pterosaur preserved with evidence of it using gastroliths. The upper teeth at the end of its snout were thicker, which would have made it easier to grab and swallow these stones. Pterodaustro lacked the bony head crests present in many other pterosaurs, which were used as display devices. However, some pterosaurs retained purely soft tissue crests, and it cannot be ruled out that the same was true of Pterodaustro. That said, the evolution of its tall, comb-like teeth would have provided pressure for it to lose or reduce the size of the crest of its ancestors, and any remaining soft tissue structure would have been limited to the back of the skull to avoid interfering with them. Like flamingos, Pterodaustro had a very long neck, even when compared to other pterodactyloid pterosaurs. This allowed it to forage from wider areas without moving the rest of its body. Compared to its massive neck and elongated snout, its torso looked tiny in comparison. However, the abdomens of Pterodaustro and other tenochasmatoids like Pterodactylus were actually long by pterodactyloid standards. Pterodaustro's feet were proportionally large for its body size, which would have been helpful when wading or swimming through the water, but were less ideal on land. Its hind limbs were relatively short, which would have made it difficult to launch into the air. The frantic way geese begin flight has been cited as a modern analog, although the launching mechanisms of pterosaurs were very different from those of birds, and the process was a smoother affair for the smaller Pterodaustro juveniles. Once in the air, the comb-toothed pterosaur flew in a manner comparable to albatrosses. Like them, it would have been an excellent long-distance flyer. Despite only being known from Argentina, Pterodaustro may have had a very expansive range. Young Pterodaustro could not fly as quickly as the adults and would have required more frequent stops when traveling long distances. On the other hand, their smaller size meant they were much more agile and maneuverable in the air. Like other pterosaurs, a large portion of its wing was supported by an incredibly long fourth finger. It accounted for 60% of the wing's length, the same as Pterodaustro's more generalized relative, Pterodactylus. All pterosaurs had pneumatic, meaning hollow, bones. However, the tenochasmatids were unusual in that this condition did not extend to their limb bones. Pterodaustro was the exception with pneumatic wing bones more in line with other pterosaurs, making it the normal one in the clade for once. Much like their cousins, the dinosaurs, pterosaurs had high metabolisms. This allowed them to be more active than most other reptiles, a necessary step in the development of powered flight. Since they didn't need to bask in the sun to warm up, pterosaurs could also have remained active at night. In 2011, a paper which claimed to be able to predict whether or not extinct taxa were nocturnal based on the shape of their orbits and sclerotic rings concluded that Pterodaustro's eyes were adapted for low-light conditions. However, multiple flaws have since been found in the model, such as it not taking into account how the shape of many reptile eyes differ from those of mammals, 
and it has proven unreliable when applied to living species. In any event, some species of flamingos are nocturnal, so the same behavior is at least plausible for their Mesozoic analog. Pterosaur bodies were covered in fuzzy filaments, which are thought to have been homologous with the feathers of birds and other dinosaurs. These primitive feathers were similar to the simple down of bird chicks and played no role in flight. Instead, they are thought to have been used for thermal regulation and perhaps display, which would have been all the more important for pterodaustro given its presumed lack of a head crest. Flamingos acquire their pink pigments from the food they eat. Given its similar diet, it has been hypothesized that pterodaustro was pink as well. However, not all birds who eat such prey are this color. So while it is more likely that the flamingo pterosaur had a flamingo-like coloration than any other, the pigment of this long extinct reptile remains far from certain. Examination of Pterodaustro's bone histology found a large medullary cavity in one specimen's femur, which is thought to have possibly contained medullary bone. Female birds use medullary bone to store calcium for egg production, and it has been found not only in the fossilized bones of the bird-like theropod dinosaurs, but also in the Ornithischian Tenontosaurus. Birds and many extinct theropods required medullary bone since their bone walls are too thin for calcium storage, a trait shared with pterosaurs. Pterosaur eggs are rarely fossilized, but three belonging to the comb-toothed pterosaur have been found at Loma del Pterodaustro. They were once the only pterosaur eggs which could be attributed to a known species, but hundreds of fossilized eggs belonging to the pterosaur Hemipterus have since been found in China. Pterodaustro's eggs had an oval shape and an outer layer which consisted of calcium carbonate crystals, the same material as the eggs of crocodilians and most dinosaurs. Previously discovered pterosaur eggs from China had soft shells more like those of turtles, and this had been assumed to have been true for other pterosaurs. The hard shells of pterodaustro eggs suggest that calcite shells were instead ancestral to archosaurs and later lost in some pterosaurs. They would not have been the only archosaurs to do so, as some dinosaurs, such as the Ceratopsian protoceratops and the prosauropod mosasaurus, also hatched from soft-shelled eggs. It was initially hypothesized that pterodaustro laid its eggs in covered nests like those of crocodilians. However, the thickness of the eggs is only a third of that typical of similarly sized bird eggs, so they would have needed to be kept in a humid environment. Additionally, the eggs show little sign of transportation, and Loma del Pterodaustro was once a shallow lake. Therefore, like so much else, it is thought Pterodaustro mirrored the strategy used by flamingos. The nests of these modern dinosaurs are constructed out of mud, tall and open, which makes them look like small volcanoes and are often surrounded by water. Nests like these would have been easily spotted by prospective egg thieves. Combined with how the eggs were found at the same site as numerous adult pterodaustro skeletons, it is highly likely that the flamingo pterosaur guarded its nest as most living archosaurs do. However, pterosaurs are not thought to have typically taken care of their offspring after hatching. Unlike most birds, young pterosaurs were capable of flight within days or even hours after hatching, which is why they are called flaplings. As mentioned earlier, their smaller size meant flaplings were slower but more maneuverable than the adults, which made them better suited for dense environments like forests and allowed them to fill different niches than their parents. Well-preserved pterodaustro flapling fossils were critical in understanding pterosaur life cycles, but it may have ironically been an exception. The flapling fossils were found in the same location as adults, a site which notably lacks the remains of any other tetrapods. If young pterodaustro had the same comb-like teeth as their parents, there would have been little benefit in them living apart from them. It is true that pterodaustro flaplings would have slowed down the flock, but taking care of immobile hatchlings for months, as many birds do, is a far greater inconvenience. Given how juvenile pterodactylus fossils are also found together with adults, parental care may have been typical of tenochasmatoidea. Study of an animal's bone histology can help to establish its age and growth rate, and due to the extensive number of available specimens of this peculiar pterosaur, its complete growth cycle is known. 
Taro Dauso's growth pattern is a mixture between that seen in birds and the more typical ectothermic reptiles. On account of its high metabolism, Taro Daustro was able to grow rapidly, obtaining over half its full size in just two years. This is much faster than most modern reptiles are capable of, even though it is still not as fast as birds. Afterwards, Taro Daustro's growth slowed down significantly, which in most reptiles usually correlates with sexual maturity. Supporting this interpretation, the medullary cavity, which presumably contained medullary bone, had already expanded in some two-year-old pterodaustro specimens. Modern birds instead reach sexual maturity in their full body size at the same time, likely since they grow so quickly, whereas pterodaustro's growth was more spread out. After sexual maturity, pterodaustro doubled in size over the next three to four years and then stopped growing entirely, much as birds and mammals do. In contrast, ectothermic reptiles continue to grow slowly throughout their lives, a trait which was retained in some extinct dinosaurs. It is little wonder that deterministic growth was present in both groups of flying archosaurs, as growing too big would have had a detrimental impact on their aerial capabilities. When people think of the age of reptiles, filter feeders are rarely what comes to mind, but Mesozoic ecosystems were no less complex than those of today. Pterodaustro had some of the most bizarre and specialized teeth in the entire animal kingdom, turning them into structures analogous with baleen. While it may not be among the most well-known pterosaurs, Pterodaustro was without a doubt one of the most spectacular of the flying reptiles. Thank you for watching, and a thank you to the Mandalorian for narrating this video. If you enjoyed it, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Finally, be sure to have a great day.